with the slides, everybody. That was my fault. I apologize. Um, before we get started with our uh, lesson this morning, say hi to Ann Roberts. She just joined us. It's so good to see you here, Ann. Welcome. Um, yay, hello. that just makes me very happy. Hello, Ann. <laughs> All right, so we are... Um, going to kind of keep going with this idea of, of talking about this amazing encouragement that we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this passage that we kind of looked at a little bit last week, where the Hebrew writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and that's the, the faith hall of fame from Hebrews chapter 11, so since we have such, such a great cloud of witnesses around us, witnesses to the faithful power of God, let us lay aside every weight and sin which, sing, which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And I want to I take a few weeks and, and really do what the Hebrew writer is asking us to do. I want to take a few weeks and look to Jesus to refocus our eyes on him as the author and finisher of our faith, because we do not want to forget. We don't ever want to lose sight of who we are in Christ Jesus. Remember, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away and the new has come. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In Christ, we are sons and daughters of God through faith. That's Galatians chapter 3. In Christ, we once were lost, but now are found. We were blind, but now we see. And so we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus because in looking in focusing on him, who he is and what he's done for us, in looking to Jesus, we are remade. We are transformed into the same image. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We become that which we behold. Because remember, when we look around at the world around us, when we focus on the fleeting things of this life, what is it that we see? And we see a lot of anxiety in the world today. I did a Google search this week for articles about coronavirus anxiety, and just looking at the titles made me anxious. But Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we look to him. What do we see when we look at the world around us? We see grief. The world is full of grief. We suffer through pain and loss all the time. And this congregation and the Lord's people are not immune to grief. But we remember what Paul told the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. He says, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. That doesn't mean we don't grieve at all, but it means that our grief is of a different kind. When we who have hope in Jesus grieve, it's a grief with a promise of relief. When we look at the world around us, we don't see that. What we see in the world around us is confusion. Is it possible to even turn on the news and not be confronted with the confusion of the world? It's, there's so much going on. The world is a confusing place. But in John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus told us, you will know the truth. And the truth 
will set you free. The world is full of voices clamoring for our attention. It's confusing to know where to turn or who to listen to if you're looking at the world. But if you're looking at Jesus, we will know the truth. And so we want to look to him. We want to look to him in the word. We want to look to him in scripture to see um, the ways that God has provided for us to deal with all of the emotions and feelings, the anxiety, the confusion, the fear, the grief that come just from living in this world. When we're grieving, we can go to the book of Lamentations. It's an entire book of Hebrew poetry that teaches us how to come before God with our grief, how to bring our pain to the Lord. We've also got the Psalms. Probably half the Psalms are written by and about people who are angry, confused, and hurt by the things that are going on in the world around them. These are poems of people who come to God upset. They come to God hurting. They come to God in pain. And Psalm 31 is a great example of this. We're going to read Psalm 31 verses 9 and 10. And as we read these verses, listen to the words the psalmist uses to describe how he's feeling. Listen to the way he talks about his life and the things he's going through and experiencing. This is Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10, and I'm going to read from the NIV. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Look at those words, distress, sorrow, grief, and anguish. Those are powerful words for the powerful emotional reaction to the afflictions of life. But there's another word in, he, in Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10. Some translations refer to it as sighing, but the NIV has a little bit more on the nose translation. It's the word groaning. Groaning is a great word to focus on in this psalm. And I want to look at and think about this word groaning for a little bit. All those other words describe emotional states, distress, sorrow, anguish, and grief. Those are things you feel. Those are emotions that are a response to the world around us. But groaning Groaning is something you do in response. A groan is what comes out when we feel those things. And in Hebrew, the word is anach. You guys, your microphones are off. Say it, say it out loud. Anach. That's the word for groaning. Feel that word. Leave your chest. Anach. It's a word that's it's, it's called an onomatopoeia. All languages have onomatopoeias. It's a word that sounds like what it is. The, the English word sigh is an onomatopoeia. R is an onomatopoeia. And a nach. A nach is that kind of verbal exhalation you make when you're feeling the anxiety and the grief and the confusion of the world. When it hits you, a nach is the response to those things. And it's a really significant word to jumpstart our look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's a really significant word when we think about the first time the word anach appears in the Bible. The very first time this word shows up in Scripture is Exodus chapter 2. You might remember Exodus chapter 2. It's the story of the baby Moses in the basket of reeds in the Nile. Remember, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has ordered that all the Hebrew baby boys be killed by being thrown in the river. 
Moses was sort of gently placed in the river. He's found and raised by Pharaoh's daughter. And one day, as he grows older, Moses comes across an Egyptian who's beating a Hebrew slave. Moses kills the Egyptian, hides his body in the sand, and flees the country. Eventually, he ends up marrying a lady named Zipporah, and he has a family there. And in Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 23, Scripture says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel, Anach, because of their slavery, and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their anach, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. We want to take a minute here and just remember These, the people of Israel, these are God's people. They are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They know the promises that God made with their ancestors. They're familiar with the exceedingly great and precious promises of the covenant. But they're also slaves. The Pharaoh died, and a new Pharaoh who views this immigrant population, the people of Israel, basically as a national security threat to Israel, to Egypt. His posture towards God's people, this immigrant group, is to oppress them horribly. He brutalizes and dehumanizes the people of Israel to the point of literally killing their children. And it's from that place of awareness of the promises and an awareness of the reality of their lives that's when the people of Israel anach in their slavery. They anach under the weight of the burden of their days. They groan because they know that it wasn't supposed to be like this. And we all know, with our knowledge of Scripture, that this is all prelude to the event that gives the book of Exodus, its name. This is all set up for the Exodus out of Egypt. But remember, Moses is still in Midian when the people anach. The overseers, the whips are still in their hands when they groan. The river is still full of babies. And God heard their groaning. He doesn't ignore it. But he does approach it in his own time, in his own way. God responds to their groaning, maybe in a way that the people didn't expect, or maybe in a way that they didn't even want. But God heard their groaning. He remembered his promise. He saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And so when their redemption comes, when God rescues his people and delivers them out of their oppression, it comes in the form of the Passover lamb. Remember, it comes in the form of that sacrifice that was made to shelter God's people under the blood that was touched to their doors. And it comes in the form of the baptism of the sea and the cloud when God separates the waters of the Red Sea to provide passage away for his people. God brings them out of Egypt, and that act of deliverance, the lamb and the sea, it becomes an annual remembrance of what God has done for his people. It becomes a celebration of their rescue. It becomes a hope for their future. And there's There's a much later prayer that the prophet Isaiah makes, and it's it's an unexpected sort of prayer, but it points back to that period of Israel's history, their redemption, deliverance, and salvation. This is Isaiah chapter 51, 
beginning in verse 9, when the prophet says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake, as in days of old, the generations of long ago. He's praying to God, wake up, wake up, arm of the Lord. And that arm of the Lord, that's a reference to God's power to deliver. Isaiah goes on, he says, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come upon Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Sorrow and Anak shall flee away. So think about this word, this groaning. The same thing that marked the bondage of God's people in Egypt, the sound of their confusion and despair and grief over the state of the world that they lived in, it's the same thing that one day will flee away. When the arm of the Lord wakes up and does what he did back then. When the Lord, when his arm of salvation, his arm of deliverance, when his arm wakes up. When the Lord returns and redeems his people from oppression and bondage and fear. And this is one of the main themes of the Bible. This is one of the main themes. Uh, driving concepts of Scripture, looking to God, the arm of the Lord, to redeem his people. It's an image that we get. It's an image that we understand intensely because we know what it means to groan. Just like the Israelites in Egypt did, just like Isaiah the prophet did, we know what Anach is. When we're confronted with the afflictions of this world, when the problems that we face, the fear, the anxiety, the grief, when it just seems to stack up higher and higher, we know what it means to groan under the weight of our anxiety and fear and confusion. It's because of the same problem the Israelites in Egypt had. It's the same problem Isaiah had. It's that contradiction that exists between knowing who God is, knowing what his will for us is, versus what we see in the world around us all the time. It's that tension between spirit and flesh, between walking in the light and walking in darkness. It makes us groan. We knock under the weight of it all. But God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw his people, and God knew. And this biblical idea, this theme of Scripture that the redemption of God will come and, and deliver us from the weight of our groaning, this theme is realized in the New Testament fulfillment. This theme is completed in Jesus. It's like Isaiah said, the New Testament writers all understood that the arm of the Lord was awake. But the waking of the arm, God's action on behalf of the groaning of his people, it didn't look like anybody expected. It looked like a baby in a manger in the back corner of the Roman Empire. The strength of the Lord's arm was shown in a man who came to earth and fed hungry people, who healed sick people, who cleaned up dirty people. It was shown in a man who used that Passover symbolism of the cup and the bread, who used that image to show us what his life and his death mean. 
And we're going to see that in just a few minutes. The way for the redeemed that Isaiah talked about, the way for the redeemed is through Christ Jesus. He lived the life that we can't live. He died the death we ought to have died. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to take on silt and sin and guilt and shame and punishment. He took all of that to the cross and he let it kill him. My sin, your guilt, our punishment, it killed him on the cross. But the ransomed of the Lord returned. We have the empty tomb to prove it. Jesus defeated death. And when he did that, he took away death's power. He delivers us from the fear of death that keeps us in slavery. He destroys that. We know this to be true, but still we groan, still we struggle, still we suffer, still we fear. Paul knew all this. Paul understood this through the Spirit. Paul gives us words of great comfort. He gives us words of great hope, and we're going to close in Romans chapter 8. We're going to close in Romans 8 as we look to Jesus the author of our faith. Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. How does all that happen? Well, that's all from Romans chapter 6. That's what happens to us at baptism when we um, are buried with Christ in death. That's the way of redemption through the depths of the sea that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 51. When Isaiah points back to the, to the Passover, to the, the deliverance, and at the same time, he points forward to the cross. Paul's telling us that we have passed by that way. If the Spirit dwells in us, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that animates us now, that we've been raised from that spiritually dead place where we once walked. And it all keys on the resurrection. It all, our hope that we have that we will be like him, the promise that the spirit that dwelt in him now dwells in us, the glory that we behold with an unveiled face, 2 Corinthians 3, the promises that we wait for, that is all resurrection hope. So now Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. All of this language of subjection and freedom and bondage and, 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 and um, hope, this is all Exodus language. This is all language that points us back to, to the way God redeems his people. He says that the, the creation will be set free from its bondage. And when the Bible talks about bondage, slavery, freedom, and redemption, remember where it started. It started with groaning. God heard the groaning. He remembered his promise. He saw his people. And God knew. Paul goes on and says, 
for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The transformation, the redemption, the deliverance from our groaning, Paul says it's like a birth process. Jesus said the same thing when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And our hope the thing that gives us hope in our inward anach. The hope we have while we patiently wait is the resurrection. It's in the empty tomb of Jesus and it is in his reborn body and his resurrected self. That's where we see ourselves. That's where we see the promise of us embodied in Christ Jesus. Jesus' own followers, Thomas, he had to see it for himself. He needed to see the scars and see the wounds. And when he did, when Thomas beheld the risen Lord, he said, my Lord and my God. And what did Jesus say back to Thomas? He said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So we're going to, we're going to at this time, we're going to turn to the Lord's Supper. We're going to sing a song um, that's going to help us to, to really think about it. We're going to sing Hallelujah, what a Savior. And as we do, as we turn our attention to the bread and the cup, those symbols of the body, and the blood that was given on the cross for us, freely given. No one took it from Jesus. He gave himself. And he said power had been given to him to take it back up again. So when we look to Jesus at this time of remembrance, of, of celebration and proclamation, where we proclaim his death until he comes, look past that. Look to the empty tomb. Look to the, the end of groaning, the end of sighing, the end of suffering, to the redemption, the deliverance, and the hope that lies on the other side of the cross. And it's all there in the resurrected Christ. So we're going to go ahead and sing. Rick, if you want to um, turn on your mic as soon as the song comes up. We'll sing hallelujah, what a savior. Okay. 